In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Francis de Sales was a contemporary of the greatest English writer, William Shakespeare. They did not meet in life, and they shall meet only briefly in the course of this sermon. But it is to that point to which I shall return briefly at the close of this sermon I have prepared for you today, and I would like to share with you some thoughts on the life of our dear patron, Francis de Sales, as a young man and as a priest, and how this applies to our spiritual life today. There are several episodes which I would like to propose for your reflection this morning. The first is that of St. Francis de Sales in his first trip to Paris. In 1578, Francis went to the College de Clermont, which was at that time run by the Jesuits, to study rhetoric and the humanities. He was being prepared by his father for an illustrious career in the world as a magistrate, and he was the heir to the family fortune. Over the course of his studies in France, where he was being trained as a great intellectual, but also as a gentleman, learning not only all of the subjects of the time, but also riding, dancing, fencing. At one point there, a good eight years later after his arrival, Francis attended a theological discussion about predestination. I have mentioned to you, perhaps from time to time, but it bears repeating right now, predestination is not one of those subjects for you to Google. It's not one for you to look up on the internet and explore out of curiosity. Predestination, properly understood, is one of the doctrines of Holy Mother Church. It is part of the faith handed down to us from the apostles. It is not a subject matter to be placed in the hands of intemperate men, for it leads invariably then to wreaking havoc upon human souls. And this is the case with the entire religion known as Calvinism. But young Francis attended at this time a discussion on this subject, and he left from this conference convinced that he was damned to hell. It is at this point that I often make a comparison between him and a man of his era, but a man who lived a good generation before him, even more, Martin Luther. We see the comparison between them, and I do not hesitate to say that in comparing these two men, we may make a comparison also, I think also, of Peter and Judas. Peter betrayed our Lord just as Judas did, but their reactions were so different afterwards. One turning in toward his pride and self-love, though he felt remorse, and ending in suicide. The other weeping bitter and humble tears of repentance and turning back to our Lord and begging his forgiveness. So too with Luther and St. Francis de Sales. Luther, despairing of his own salvation, ended by inventing a new religion by which one need not participate in one's salvation at all, by which one's salvation is assured simply by a faith that is no more than a sort of trust. Thus he could boast of his sinfulness, and so would his followers, and they would go about committing the most atrocious sins to show that nothing could ever separate them from the grace of Christ. St. Francis de Sales had quite a different reaction. Despairing of his own salvation, haunted by this doctrine of predestination, by the awesomeness of Almighty God and his sovereignty, and despairing of how they could ever be reconciled with human freedom, turned to prayer. He placed himself before a famous image in Paris of Our Lady, known as the Black Madonna, 
Our Lady of Good Deliverance. There he consecrated himself to the Blessed Virgin, and he tells us that all of his scruples, all the thoughts of despair fell off of him like so many scales. And from that moment onward, he would dedicate his life to sharing that message with all people, that God is love. The second episode I would like to share with you then is that of the newly ordained Francis de Sales. I hope you all know at least a little bit about the marvelous history of the conversion of the Chablais. It is a delight for us to sit down in the comfort of our own home and read the Catholic Controversy, which is a collection of the pamphlets written by Francis in the course of his mission to the Chablais. Those pages are full of great learning, searing rhetoric, and disarming humor. We are truly invited to tour the mind of Francis de Sales as he refutes the Calvinist heresy point by point. But if we were simply to conclude that these pages alone led to the conversion of 70,000 people, nearly all the inhabitants of the Chablais, over the course of four years, we would be missing a piece of the puzzle. These pages of Francis de Sales are not the musings of a blogger. They are the desperate scribblings of a missionary, daily on the run. When Francis arrived with his cousin Louis as a young missionary priest in the former Swiss territory of the Chablais in 1594, he did not grace the scene as a splendid knight, insisting on in all the dignities of his noble lineage. No, he was content to follow the admonition of St. Paul, who tells all the disciples of Christ, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought not the Godhead something to be clung to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Yes, St. Francis, in imitation of his master, emptied himself among those whom he wished to win to the truth of the gospel. If they were moved by his words whenever he managed to get his little pamphlets to them, before they were seized upon or destroyed by the Calvinist leaders, they were moved by his words because they first were moved by all of his prayers for them and then by his good example. Seeing him sleeping under trees, desperately trying to find lodging, being threatened again and again by armed guards, being denounced as a sorcerer, slandered in all manner of ways, Yes, this man brought down to nothing, reduced to nothing among these people, despised and rejected of men. This was the man whose words could move their hearts. And it is here that we first see the heart of St. Francis de Sales, a man who is not a sounding gong or a tinkling cymbal, a man whose heart was burning with the love for souls, desiring only that they might all one day be converted to the truth and see God in the face. After his glorious success in the Chablais in 1599, Francis was named coadjutor to the Bishop of Geneva. Pope Clement VIII was willing to agree to this, but only after he examined the candidate personally. For already he was famous and he desired to meet him. And so he examined him before all of the sacred college. At the end of the examination, the Pope said to Francis, drink, my son, from your cistern and from your living wellspring. May your waters issue forth. May they become public fountains where the world may quench its thirst. This prophecy of the Pope 
would soon be realized. He returned from Rome, but then was immediately sent on mission to Paris, a diplomatic mission for the return of the Catholic faith to a certain part of the diocese, which had only been returned to it. It was then when he made the great friendships in Paris of Cardinal de Berulle, the secretary of Henry IV, and also the king himself. This king, who had only now brought a temporary peace to the religious wars in France, and soon desired to be friends with this illustrious preacher. The king made him stay in Paris to preach all throughout Lent, and saw immediately that this was a man whose words could touch the hearts of lay people, people living very imperfect lives in the world, people given on a daily basis to many sins, and caused them to reform their lives even while living in the world. The preaching here would be the beginning of what would become St. Francis's bestseller for all time, the introduction to the devout life. I close with one final episode in the life of our saint by returning to the thought of England. It might seem that it is not particularly worth commenting on that St. Francis was a contemporary of Shakespeare, but it is a good point of reference for us. This was a time when England had now made a permanent rift with the Catholic faith. After Henry VIII and the horrid reign of Edward VI, and after a brief return to the faith under Queen Mary, now the time of Elizabeth I seemed to solidify forever England in its rebellion against Catholic unity. St. Jane Francis de Chantal at the proceedings for Francis's canonization testified that this was a cause for permanent anguish in the heart of St. Francis de Sales throughout his life. He earnestly desired to be able to go as a missionary to England if the Pope would send him so that he might win this country back to the faith. The Pope would never send him on such a mission. St. Francis, however, would go on this mission all the same, not in person, but with his writings. In 1613, the first English version of the introduction to the devout life was produced at Douai, where, in France, where so many English intellectuals were in exile. It was translated by a certain John Yaworth. And Yaworth dedicated this first English edition of The Devout Life to none other than Anne Roper, the great granddaughter of St. Thomas More. Thus it was through the family of the great English martyr that St. Francis de Sales arrived at last on English shores. It soon saw many other editions, and it was soon pirated as well by the Anglicans. And not long after, indeed while Francis was still alive, a beautiful edition was presented to King James I. It is said then that James I loved this book so much that he carried it on his person for most of his life and could be heard saying again and again, how I long to meet the author. It was not meant to be. Francis and the Presbyterian king would never meet. <clears throat> but we see, nevertheless, this great victory of St. Francis de Sales and the arrival of his words on the shores of England, which would produce so much fruit over those centuries of persecution that remained right up until the time of the second spring and the resurgence of the Catholic hierarchy and the massive conversions that would occur in the 19th century. As far as we know, Shakespeare never read St. Francis de Sales, but the immediate successors of Shakespeare in the poetical world did. 
The great Richard Crashaw, Catholic convert, loved St. Francis de Sales, and his poetry is very much inspired by the writings of our saint. The words of St. Francis de Sales, when we study his life and take the time to meditate upon it, especially on his feast day, remind us that mercy does not exclude justice, prudence does not exclude courage, gentleness does not exclude zeal. The words of our saint have force because of the life of the one who penned them. Who has ever read St. Francis de Sales, any of his works at all, without ending by longing to meet him? Certainly it will be one of our great joys. We know once we study his life that although we long to meet him in heaven, he would also be very much welcome this evening at dinner. He would be the perfect dinner guest. One day, though, God willing, we shall all meet our dear patron in heaven. That smile will be there to greet us along with the smiles of so many in the court of heaven. And we shall all then be able to thank him, thank him for his cooperation with the grace of God, who flowed through him and continues to dwell in our lives through the works that have taught us all to pursue the devout life. St. Francis de Sales, Doctor of Charity, Patron of the Institute of Christ the King, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.